the next generation of human activity in low Earth orbit will be made in China. As the era of the International Space Station comes to a whimpering end, the rise of China's heavenly palace sets the stage for a new step forward in our effort to colonize near-Earth space and expand our understanding of life and the universe. Okay, I know that was a touch dramatic, but hopefully it grabbed your attention. Today, let's talk about the new crop of Earth-orbiting space stations that will be vying to fill the gap left by the outgoing ISS. More than just filling a gap, actually, more like creating an entirely new industry. Because 10 years from now, we could be looking at a situation where instead of just one space station up there, we could have as many as five or six individual stations run by separate operators. That's a very drastic acceleration. And like it or not, China is leading the way in this space with their Tiangong station. There are a lot of private companies with a lot of great ideas for different space station designs, and we will get into those a little later, but China is currently the only group with a functioning crew module already in orbit right now, and with a clear plan to expand their existing core into a fully operational space station. This comes at the same time that the rapidly aging ISS enters its final phase of life, one that is under threat of being cut even shorter by a fractured relationship between funding partners, the United States, and Russia. So, what's next for life in space? This is the space race. Let's start with a brief history. The Chinese space program dates back farther than you might think. I know I was surprised to learn that China started developing aerospace technology in the late 1950s alongside the United States and the Soviet Union. China was kind of a unsung contender in the original space race. The Chinese actually had some decent success in the late 1950s and early 1960s by essentially reverse engineering Soviet rockets and making their own copies. By 1964, China was able to launch a crew of mice into orbit. And when the conquest of the moon became the hot topic in the late 1960s, Chairman Mao decided that China should do it too. By 1969, China had developed a heavy lift satellite launch vehicle that they had derived from an intercontinental ballistic missile design. This birthed the Long March series of rockets that continue on through today. Fun fact, the name Long March comes from the formative year of Mao Zedong's command over the Red Army. To escape annihilation by Chinese nationalists, Mao led his troops in a circling retreat that lasted 370 days and covered 9,000 kilometers of rugged mountain terrain. By 1971, the Chinese were making plans for a crewed mission to space with a target date of 1973. Of course, at the same time, the Republic was entering the height of the Cultural Revolution, a pretty infamous period of unrest where Mao fought to purge all remnants of capitalism and traditional society from Chinese society. It was a bad time for a lot of reasons, but it was a particularly bad era for the Chinese space program, which came to a relative halt in the 70s and pretty much died alongside Chairman Mao in 76. But there was a resurrection. Much like any dead character from Star Wars, somehow China's space program returned by sending astronaut Yang Liwei into orbit in the year 2003. This made them only the third country to have achieved independent human spaceflight. Think about that one for a second. While every other nation was just hitching rides on NASA's space shuttle, China decided to do it on their own using the Long March 2 rocket and their Shangzhou 5 spacecraft. Fast forward to spring 2021, China launched the core module of the Tiangong space station into orbit by a Long March 5 rocket. Tiangong translates roughly to Heavenly Palace. This is the first stage of a new, permanent station owned by the Chinese government, and that is a very big deal, because China isn't allowed on the International Space Station. In 2011, the United States government officially barred Chinese astronauts from visiting the ISS, citing some reasoning about technology and security. Which is sadly comical in hindsight, 
because now Russia are the bad guys again, and they own half of the damn station. Honestly, the United States probably did the most to fuel the Chinese space program by isolating them from the international coalition and forcing China to pursue their own ambitions. Anyways, Tiangong is envisioned to become a multi-module next generation space research station. China experimented with two prototype modules. The first launched in 2011. These were very small 10 ton space stations about the same size as a SpaceX Crew Dragon or Starliner. These were both deorbited after serving their purpose as trial runs, and about one year ago, China put the real thing into low Earth orbit. The core module of Tiangong is a 20 ton habitation module. From the outside, the Tiangong bears strong resemblance to the old Russian Mir space station. It's been said that Russia was heavily involved in assisting China with the design process for the module. But on the inside, Tiangong is the latest modern technology. I'm sure you've already seen the photo comparisons of the ISS interior against the Tiangong interior. It's night and day. ISS is a cramped rat's nest of 20 years worth of tech all cobbled together with exposed wires everywhere, while China's new module is sleek, clean, and modern. In addition to the core module, China have two additional science modules to come, with the second module launch scheduled for May 2022, and the third supposedly going up to complete the first phase of Tiangong by the end of this year. That first phase will still be relatively small, it's looking like about one quarter the size of the 16 module International Space Station, but Tiangong will make much more efficient use of its interior space and power system. It's being estimated that Tiangong will house up to 12 astronauts while the ISS maxes out at 9 people. In addition, Tiangong is powered by gallium photovoltaic cells, which is a recent development in solar energy and is both highly efficient and resilient to heat. The solar system of the Chinese station should prove to be a major improvement and will allow the station to use electric ion thrusters to hold its place in orbit. The current ISS burns about 9 tons of rocket fuel every year to maintain its own position at a cost annually in the billions of dollars. Tiangong is also planned to have its own robotic arm, very similar to the existing Canada arm, but obviously updated with the latest and greatest in robotics technology. There is even a plan for Tiangong to have its own space telescope by 2024. This would be a separate module that orbits in parallel to the station with the ability to dock to Tiangong periodically for adjustments and refueling. This telescope should meet or exceed the capabilities of the famous Hubble Space Telescope. China is also already shopping the Tiangong around as a commercial playground in space. They're looking for paying customers to come visit the station that range from international research projects to space tourism. China claims that within the next decade, anyone will be able to visit Tiangong as long as they can afford the trip. So here's an interesting question. As an American company, will SpaceX Dragon capsules be allowed to dock with Tiangong? Probably not. And it also looks like China themselves are eyeing up the creating of a commercial spaceflight option. They are currently expanding the capacity of their Shenzhou crew capsule from three to six passengers and the Chinese Academy of Sciences is aiming to offer rides to space tourists as soon as 2025. So we know that NASA has no intention of trying to build their own replacement for the ISS. Much like with their crewed flights to orbit, they have decided to let the private sector take the wheel and figure it out for them. Unfortunately, the only proven contender in private spaceflight, SpaceX, are not in the running for a new space station this time around. They're more than busy enough with the Starship and the next moon lander and trying to get to Mars, so no big surprise there. That leaves us with a field of grand ideas that may or may not be practical or even possible, but let's take a look regardless. Think Orbital. This is a very small and relatively unknown company, but they have a design for something they call Orb2. It's a small and funny looking kind of space station with a powered propulsion module at the core and a big spherical inflatable habitation module on the top. For some reason, 
it makes me think of Spaceballs. NanoRacks. This is a company who have already done a bunch of work on the ISS. They are well known and trusted in the aerospace industry. Their StarLab concept is a super compact four person station that can be deployed in a single rocket launch. This would feature an inflatable crew section, its own robot arm, and a state of the art research laboratory. Orbital Reef. This is a Blue Origin led project for a substantial new outpost in space. The backbone of the station is three solid modules in a line that are a massive six meters in diameter. They're obviously counting on the ultra wide fairing size of the new Glenn rocket to get these things into orbit. So hopefully that idea actually pans out. The station is covered in docking ports and connection hardware. It looks extremely modular and expandable. There is a connected truss structure with the thermal radiators and solar panel array. We see several inflatable modules. These would be constructed by Sierra Space. And we also see the Dream Chaser space plane from Sierra docked to the station as well. So they're clearly eyeing that vehicle up as a crew and cargo transport. The Starliner by Boeing also makes a brief appearance in the promo video. So if that ever actually works, it will have a place at Orbital Reef. And again, the question, will SpaceX be allowed to visit? The next one is Axiom Space. And this is cool and probably the most feasible idea. So Axiom has a plan to begin their station by adding modules to the existing ISS. So there would be three Axiom modules that get attached to ISS, one being a power and propulsion unit and another being an observation deck. The observation platform has this idea for an insane cupola window that is basically like being inside a glass box in space. It would be so crazy to experience. Anyway, at the point that the Axiom modules are up and running and the ISS is scaling down, the Axiom cluster would detach from the main station and become its own thing, maintaining the ability to expand further. So that's the vision for the future of life in space. China obviously has the leg up here as they're the only contender with an actually functioning space station and very clear and imminent plans to expand it into something that is fully functional and open for business within a matter of a few years. All of these private companies have some really neat ideas and it would be amazing if they all managed to succeed. There is plenty of room for everyone but it will be very fascinating to watch these develop and see who actually emerges as a contender and how the final designs compare to the concept renderings. It's going to be a really exciting few years in space. Let us know in the comments, are you rooting for China to succeed or which private alternative would you throw your money behind? Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.